morning. Welcome to Millwood United Methodist Church. I'm Karen Wheat, retired pastor and small group coordinator here at the church. We want to really welcome you all to worship this day. If you wouldn't mind, please leave a comment uh, so that we can know who's watching and people don't fall through the cracks. So now, get your cup of coffee or whatever, sit back, find your holy place, and let's worship. We continue our Lenten season of recovery as we focus on health as essential to our spiritual lives. Vessels holy and whole, broken, needing the soul healer come. The demands of following Jesus are great. He shows us that sometimes we must make extraordinary efforts to move in a new direction. As we consider the health of humanity, we cannot ignore the need to heal the very planet that sustains us. We live in increasing chaos of a beleaguered environment and the hoarding of resources. We want to be saved by something or someone else, but we discover this week that we are in the boat with the one who shows us our power to turn it around, to calm the storm. We protect the jewel that is our home, restoring something beautiful from scars of the past. Vessels holy and poor, broken, needing the one open, body and soul, heal the Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, renew our holy vessels, especially this holy container of life on which we live this very planet. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning you created this universe with a phrase, let it be. And the waters and dry land, the sky and the creatures were formed. You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to care for and honor all things. We have not successfully answered that call. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we gorged ourselves, taking more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We are afraid that if we look any closer, we will see our own responsibility. But we now are witnesses to the forces of a world more broken than when we inherited it. Water, wind and wave, fire and drought and earthquake. Help us, healer. Show us our ability to chart a different course. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Broken, needing the one 
body and soul, healer, continue with our worship, let us enter into our time of prayer. As we do, breathe out the trials and the tribulations and all the cares of this past week and breathe in the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Healer of every ill, especially our fractured creation. We come to lay our cares before you. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities of grief of our time. You remind us that even in the middle of the storm, you are in the boat with us. We give you thanks for this path of following you. Even when you call us to cross over from one way of life to another. We especially pray for all who are impacted most by dwindling resources. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how other actions affect others. I'm going to do that line again. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others, not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake-up calls that our young people are sounding, and we pray for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of activists and educators who help us wake up to the storm, to see that we have it within our power to calm that storm, to restore the Earth's wholeness. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate 
how we as a church can join this effort now and into the future. This we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel. Now when Jesus saw the crowd, he ordered his disciples to go over to the other side of the lake. A legal expert came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and the birds in the sky have nests, but the human one has no place to lay his head. Another man, one of his disciples, said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. When Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. A huge storm arose on the lake, so that waves were sloshing over the boat. But Jesus was asleep. They came and woke him, saying, Lord, rescue us, we're going to drown. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you people of weak faith? Then he got up and gave orders to the winds and the lake, and there was a great calm. The people were amazed and said, What kind of person is this? Even the whole, the winds and the lake obey him. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto thee, O Lord my God. Amen. Storms are majestic things. They cause us to realize just how insignificant we actually are the flashing of the lightning, the clapping of the thunder, the blowing of the wind. Wow, what power. Now that reminds me of a story. One night in the midst of a terrible storm, a pastor, remembering that he had left some important papers in the church, ran across the field from the parsonage to the church through the rain. As he was doing so, he caught sight of a burglar in the act of trying to break into the church through one of the windows. Now, I hope you know, in surprising a burglar can be a very dangerous thing to do, but this pastor was a pretty gutsy guy. He shouted at the man, hey! The burglar stopped dead in his tracks, slowly turned to face the pastor, and with menacing step, started to walk toward the pastor. Just then, lightning struck a tree just a few feet away from the burglar, and a terrible clap of thunder occurred. The burglar turned white as a sheet, and his eyes became as wide as saucers. The pastor, immediately realizing the significance of the moment, had the presence of mind to point a finger at the burglar and say, and the next one's for you. And with that, the burglar ran away, never to be seen again. We who live near the Great Lakes are very accustomed to the violent storms that can occur on water. The bottom of every Great Lake is littered with wrecks of sturdy ships who didn't make it through the storm. One of the most, most famous is memorialized in the song by Gordon Lightfoot, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I can remember when that happened. And I was profoundly affected when that happened because I actually had seen the Edmund Fitzgerald go through the Sioux Locks a year or so before that. And I remember she was just 
huge. In fact, when she was launched in 1958, she was the largest ship on the Great Lakes. She was a most impressive Great Lakes freighter. In fact, the most impressive Great Lakes freighter I had ever seen. Yet she too was no match for the gales of November in 1975. To this day, she remains the largest ship to have ever sunk on the Great Lakes. You know, storms have, our way of, have a way of getting our attention and cause us to do some real soul searching. Over the past few weeks, we have been looking into how Jesus is the key to healing our brokenness. Today, I want us to focus on the brokenness that exists in the cosmos. We live in a physically broken world that desperately, desperately needs our attention. And it's about time this storm gets our attention. So what does that have to do with the scripture of the day? Well, let's take a look. When the storm hits, Jesus and the boys are out in a small boat on the Sea of Galilee. Now, just to get an idea about the Sea of Galilee, I was so disappointed when I went to the Holy Land to see it because it's a lake. It's not a sea. It's kind of about the size of Torch Lake or Houghton Lake, you know. It's a lake. You can see across it all the way. It's 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. I expected at least something like the Great Lakes, but not so. It's just a lake. And so I found myself wondering why, when caught in the storm, why these disciples were so afraid. They were experienced sailors, fishermen. This wasn't their first rodeo. They'd been out in boats before, and I'm sure they'd encountered storms before. This indeed couldn't have been their first encounter with bad weather. Well, then my imagination took over. I imagined Jesus having had a hard day and wanting to get away from the crowd saying, okay, boys, let's, let's go over to the other side of the lake. That way we can have some peace and quiet and we can unwind. And they then responding, if we walk around the lake, it's gonna take forever. Let's get in the boat and row across. It'll be a shortcut. Now, I want you to get an idea about these boats that were on the Great Lakes, or rather on the Sea of Galilee. They were only about 20 to 25 feet long. And these were 12 full grown men plus Jesus. So I can imagine Jesus looking at the boat, looking at the guys and saying, are you sure you want to do that? It's going to be awfully crowded. And the disciples all answering, oh yeah, no problem, no sweat. We're just going to go across the lake. And remember, that's only eight miles at the largest point. We don't know exactly how many miles where they were taking off from. We're just going to go across the lake. We'll just all smooch together and we'll be there in no time and we can then relax. And it's going to be a lot faster and a lot easier than walking. It's a shortcut. And then I can imagine Jesus saying, are you sure? And them answering, oh yeah, no problem, no problem. We're seasoned fishermen. We've done it hundreds of times. And then Jesus saying, well, okay, if you're sure. 
And with that, all of them get into the boat. Thirteen full-grown men into a boat about the size of two of our regular rowboats put together. Needless to say, it was overcrowded and top-heavy. But even so, they set sail. Now, storms on the Sea of Galilee are different than storms on other regular inland lakes. The location of the lake makes it very vulnerable to rapid and intense changes in the weather. You see, the mountains are so arranged around the lake that the wind shooting down into the valley from the far side of the lake funnel, are funneled over the mountains. Lakes, or winds from the Mediterranean are funneled over the mountains causing gale force winds and waves that sometimes travel over 200 feet upon up on the shore. Given all of that, we can begin to see how being adrift in a boat in the middle of a lake at night during a storm really got the disciples' attention. And scripture indicates that this particular storm, storm must have really been a doozy. The Greek word that's used to describe it is seismos. And that's the same word that's used for a massive earthquake. So we know this was a really, really bad storm. So there they are, out in a small boat after dark, furious storm raging, tossing the little boat around like a cork, waves washing over the hull. All the disciples who weren't actually trying to steer the boat were busy trying to bail out all of the water that had come over the hull. They were soaking wet and they were frantically trying to bail out. And all the while, there's Jesus, sound asleep in the boat. He must have been soaked to the skin too, but he slept. He must have really been tired, unless his name was really Vince. My husband can sleep through anything. God had finally gotten their attention. Finally, the disciples knew they needed help. So finally, they went over to wake Jesus. Now, in my imagination, I can see it kind of playing out something like this. One of the disciples said, you wake him. I'm not going to wake him. You wake him. I'm not going to make wake him, not me. And back and forth and back and forth until finally somebody, and I would imagine Peter, said, I'll wake him. And then he starts shaking Jesus and saying, wake up, wake up, Lord, save us. Save us. We're about to drown. Wake up, wake up. Now, you know that they were in deep trouble when a bunch of sailors asked a carpenter what to do in this situation. They were desperate, panicked, in real fear of drowning. And so they come to the guy that raised, or they come to the guy who was raised inland because they had nowhere else to go no one else to turn to. Now, at this time, they were not so much convinced that he is God, but they are certainly hoping he is. God had finally gotten their attention. They finally realized they needed Jesus and his active presence in their lives. I'm always amazed 
at how little people have changed over the centuries. The, the way people acted centuries ago matches how people deal with problems today. Now, the disciples could have done any of three things. First, they could have done nothing. Just ignored the storm, hoped that it might go away, but probably would sink the boat and maybe they'd all drown. Or maybe not. So they could have just done nothing. Secondly, they could have kept frantically bailing, mindlessly working with no plan or thought of possibilities to, to survive that dangerous storm. No satisfactory solutions to their dilemma. Or they could get some informed help on how to respond. The disciples had run out of energy and human solutions, all because they had wanted to take a shortcut. When they realized that they had run out of purely human answers, they finally turned to the divine for help. They hoped that this miracle worker who healed so many people could somehow save them from the storm. Our planet is a small ship in the midst of a storm. It is ecologically broken. We've got into the dilemma the brokenness, because we, like the disciples, kept wanting to take shortcuts. We began exploiting our planet for short-term gain with no thought of long-term consequences. And the result? Massive climate change. And our refusal to recognize that climate change, change caused by humanity's shortcut mindset and our addiction to fossil fuels, which leads to greenhouse emissions and the warming of the planet, and causing untold counts of destruction and, and suffering, we fail to recognize that that is actually a form of evil. Eco-theologian Cynthia Molobda calls it, quote, Syst systemic evil, unquote, that enlists the over-consuming class of society in its never-ending greed for more at the cost of untold suffering to billions across the planet. So what do we do? We have the same options that the disciples had. We can do nothing. We can keep going down the path that we've been going. And scientists tell us if we do that, our environment will be irreversibly damaged by the year 2050. Or we can do half-hearted, frantic, frantic attempts to deal with the emergencies that pop up with no real plan for the future. We can wake up and consult the ruler of the universe regarding plans of action as he has revealed them to the modern day prophets of ecology and see what steps need to be taken in and in what order they need to be followed and then follow them. 
I personally recommend that last option. So now that God has our attention, what is the voice of the Lord saying today? In the midst of these catastrophic weather events, in the midst of these climate of this climate crisis, what is the word of the Lord? At the time when our little boat of planet Earth is more threatened than it ever has been by the storm of our own making, it appears that someone is blithely asleep in the deck below. And it appears that we don't want to wake him. We want to leave Christ asleep in the boat. And it doesn't seem to ever cross our minds to consult him on what to do and how to deal with the situation. There is a profound unknownness to the inner workings of God's mind and no apparent desire to really get to know God's mind at all. The problem with corporations who profit so mightily from our addiction to fossil fuel is that they have no fear of the Lord. In fact, they think of themselves as gods with the power to affect wind and weather just like God in whatever way they desire. But literally, thank God. God has finally gotten our attention. And some people are starting to wake up. There are individuals and groups of citizens who are waking up to the reality of the state of our planet. They are realizing the way in which our purchases and choices of energy sources are connected with the storms and droughts that ravage our communities and lives. They are rousing from sleep, as it were, and finally taking up the work of rebuking those economic systems that cause the raging wind and waves. Perhaps that is one way to under the, understand the story of Jesus being roused from sleep to calm the storm. It might be that his actions are really a parable that might begin something like, the kingdom of God is like waking from sleep to confront the storm. Perhaps the Jesus we seek is within us, just waiting to be roused from sleep to rebuke the forces that are causing the raging and the wind and the waves in our environment. Waking the Christ within us, I believe, is the only way we can stand up and confront the storm of systemic evil and call for another way to live. That can be intimidating to stand up to the mighty Goliaths of industry who laugh at our tiny, insignificant voices. But stand up, we must. Think of, think of Greta Thunberg, a teenager, an insignificant nobody, really, just a teenager, a schoolgirl, who has wakened to the fact that the world is in mortal danger and who has tried to waken us all as she speaks out about environment, environmental justice and change. And she, even though she has received much resistance and ridicule, has confronted the powers who think of themselves greater than God and have held them accountable. 
in the good news. The good news is those Goliaths of industry will fall just as easily as the waves and the wind before the hand of Jesus if they don't do something to change. Environmental health impacts more than we can even imagine. If we work toward recovery of ourselves and our communities, but fail to work toward the recovery of our environment, we will find ourselves caught up in constant cycles of destruction. The healing of all creation is intertwined and interdependent. We have not always cared for creation the way we ought. We are all guilty of taking shortcuts and not being wise caretakers of the planet. That must change. We must do our part to restore this planet in such a way that it again becomes something beautiful that will last for generations to come. My friends, wake up the sleeping Christ within you. Call upon the Lord to help you do your part to save the environment. And through the power of God, help us all to save this little boat we call Earth a boat that is truly in peril on the sea of the universe. Amen. Lord God, help us. Help us to wake up, call upon you, and get busy about doing your work to heal our broken environment. Amen. Oh, uh -huh.
now go with confidence that we can face the storm with Jesus in the boat, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. And may the words of Jesus ring in your ears, follow me. And may the spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul and a spring to your step. Receive the blessing of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>